He was born in Curaçao, now lives and works in Amsterdam. He has worked in Europe, the US, and the Caribbean. And in line, his uh, in line with his slogan, I am because you are, he studies the intersection of culture, leadership, and branding, and what these mean for employees and their perception of business leaders. He is co-founder of Spot On HR, which he started with his university friend, Marcus. And Markus von Lepe, also co-founder of Spot On HR, um, also has more than 20 years of experience in the software, internet, e-commerce, and media business. In his last position, he was responsible for HR with his in Axel Springer's a large portfolio of digital assets. He has vast experience in the areas of hypergrowth, organizational development, transformation leadership, and culture. And what you will hear in this session that's coming up now is they will show how HR professionals can really add value to the business. They are going to introduce us to the concept of the maturity curve of a company. And they are also going to have a discussion on uh, how talent management patterns of your companies should look like and why. And at the end, just as in our last session, we will have about 10, 15 minutes for a discussion. But now, please welcome to the stage Edson and Marcus. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Florian, and uh, welcome to our session. Um, I think it's a wonderful location. I think the weather outside could be a bit better, but uh, that is not in our hand. So, today, so this is Marcus and this is my friend Edson, and Hi. we will speak about the art of adding value. So, Edson, is everything fine with German and English? So, what do you think? So, um, meine deutsche Sprache ist nicht perfekt, ne? so, so if, you, if you want to ask questions in German, please do it, I do understand, but I, I won't speak it, I will not torture you with it, um, and if I don't understand, Marcus will, will translate. I will try my best. So, the art of adding value, I have to say, is a big topic. Are you sure we're putting the right topic here in place of the others? Well, when we started thinking about the session, we said, yeah, let's go for it. And actually, last night, we were panicking a bit. We said, well, that's a big, big title we put up there. But we hope that by the end of the session, we can share with you some of our experiences and that you can take that away to your businesses. Um, because I believe HR is about, it's an art. We make HR too gray. We think it's all about payroll and processes and systems. But actually, it's about connecting at the real conversation with your leadership team and what are you going to do with your people in the organization. And that's an art. And we need to start standing up for our art. Yeah. Okay, then let's start. Yeah. So, one sec. So, what does it mean for us to be spot on? Yeah. I don't know what's, uh, what spot on is for you, and there's a later question for that. For us, it's very much that you actually deliver intuitive impact. What do I mean with that? Meaning it's a consultative selling approach that you just don't come up with solution right away, but you really try to understand first what the problem is. Think and then you deliver a solution. The second thing is what we truly believe in, you don't have to have always uh, uh, the answer yourself. But there is a big network out there, and I think this is a good example. I mean, you guys are a bunch of HR professionals, and this is already a network. So very often, the answer lies somewhere within the network, and that can be a technology answer. It could be an answer from someone who has more expertise. So really take advantage of that. Uh, a third thing, what we truly believe in, and I mean, we're already a bit older than most of you guys. So when we started our business uh, back in the days, so Agile was uh, not founded yet. So today, uh, to work Agile also in HR, I think it's a fascinating thing. And very often, HR people have not the guts or are not courageous enough to do that for some reasons. So in product technology, they all have MVPs, minimum vile products, or prototyping. So how come that we don't use these things and approaches? And I think you should. Another thing is, sorry, here. Of course, we both probably on this stage gather experiences from the old world and the new world across different industries. And 
yes, there is a little like, uh, there's a little advantage of being a bit older, having gray hair or no hair. Or no hair at all. Yeah, um, we have done it before, or at least we have seen it before. Sometimes that helps because you can see a lot of pattern, and these patterns actually repeat themselves. So relax, a lot of that, what you might encounter and might find, probably has been encouraged or experienced by someone else before. So that is for us to be spot on. So, but who are the funny guys here on stage? So who are we that we think that we are entitled uh, to say something about it? So we all, all we, the both of us are old university friends back in the days and uh, I don't know, it's too long ago. We're not going to talk about We're it. We're not going to, better not going to talk about it. So, um, but maybe interesting that together we have 40 years of profound HR experiences. We both had been HR executives and uh, experts in various uh, industries across different industries, countries, whatsoever. And I think that is a nice experience, it's, uh, the nice experience what we bring to the table. And we have experience from uh, startups to multinationals. And also there sometimes you see patterns which try to repeat themselves. Another thing is, and I think that is the same with for you guys, you have responsibility for the full value chain of HR. And that is quite a responsibility you have to deal with. And we know how that feels. Yes, some industries, I mean, you can read yourself. I think that's fine. So, Edson, so how do we do this? And what is our belief when we want to be spot on? Well, I think when you want to be spot on, it's all about HR being able to add value. And that's, that's our belief. And we hope that by the end of this session, you can answer the question for yourself, what is it that you need to do to add value? For me, for us, added value means being able to have the right level of conversations at the table with your leadership team and with your organization. Because if you cannot have those right conversations and really define what the issues are that you're dealing with, you won't be able to add value. Your role will be diminished into a process role or a system role. It's about having the right courageous conversation. Yeah? HR is a differentiating factor for success. Um, and let us move on to the next slide and see um, where, where, we can make that, where we can make that differentiation happen. Over and over again, what I see with HR professionals is that we are a lot of times on the offense. We don't take a stand and we don't become proactive um, by saying to the business, we have the solution for a lot of the issues that you're, you're dealing with. The other thing we're seeing with HR professionals a lot of times is that um, um, you don't, we don't have opinions. We follow the advice of the business. Or we sit with the business and think about what they're saying, and then we say, okay, we will solve this for you. While my strong and our strong belief is, we need to be at the table and sometimes say to the business, well, I don't think this is the right solution. And we do have an opinion about your sales targets and your growth and the market you're gonna go into and the impact it's gonna have on our employees and why we need to do it differently. And Marcus, if we move to, move to, the, vo to the next slide, it's also about um, 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 having, having the right impact, if you, if you could click to. It's about changing, changing the mindset of our colleagues also in this process. Um, and that's a, that's a tough task. That's a tough task because moving from process to systems to having a business dialogue is a big jump. So these are for us um, the four to five elements that I think HR professionals need to start stepping into to really start crafting and being able to use the art of adding value. Um, and the other one, and that's the last one, stop apologizing and stop asking for permission to sit at the table. Mm. Just sit at it. And maybe you can add, add one thing, and we have seen that many times with many clients, but also we have experienced that many times ourselves. Maybe it's also a bit a German thing. As HR executives, you are so much focusing on doing things right. Yeah, this is what you all focus on. And very often, the most important question is not been answered. And the most important question is, it's not about doing things right, but are we doing the right things? 
There's a slight difference, yeah? And there's a huge Atlantic in, in between yeah. the, of the two phrases. And be really, really sure that you're not just spending all the time on doing things right. Because half of that is spent on wrong stuff. But be spot on and try to do the right thing. That's where you start adding the value we all dream about and we think that should be something HR executive, executives should look at. Yep. So, Marcus, now we're going to move to the next slide. And this is your part. Yes, I know, I know. So, so Marcus is going to talk about this, and I'm going to make his life really difficult. Mm. If you think that I'm not making it difficult enough, you can make it also difficult. So I'm inviting you to ask him questions. So are you sweating? Yes, I am. Good. So um, what I'm going to do now is um, I have actually some old colleagues there, and they hate this slide. Uh, it's a called the maturity curve slide. And this is, uh, there's no pattern on this slide, whatever. It's a very straightforward one. And I show that, and I would like to guide you through, because I want you to think, where is your business on that maturity curve? And I will teach you through. It's not that, it's not that hard. And the question is, if you have analyzed where your business is on that maturity curve, can you translate the right supporting HR methods, activities, and projects which support you to be on that slide and to go the next step? And as always, when a business is starting, it starts with a startup phase. We probably guess there are some people reflecting startups. And a startup phase, usually you have two founders, couple founders, and I think maybe the Pozzonio founders are pretty much of the same kind. They had a dream. They wanted to achieve something. They wanted to be independent. They are entrepreneurial. Yeah? And for that, they decided to do their own business. There are a lot of risks. There are no promises. There's just a big heart. And very often at these stages, from an HR point of view, maybe the basis for culture is set. Yeah? But from other points of view, HR, very little at that stage has been done. Because you gather some friends around, some experts, and then you just go for it. Yeah? And you know the startup phase, so I always say, if the founders can conclude a message or a dream, and they stick to that, and st stay really focused on that, you can't ask for more in the startup phase. And very often, and that is sometimes, uh, sometimes a risk and sometimes an opportunity. At the second stage, you get money, some funding. And with that funding, you have to uh, realize and you have to make a decision, how do we spend the money on? And of course, very often, especially in digital, uh, you spend the money on people. Yeah? So what does it mean to be in the growth phase? First of all, it means that you have to have a concentration on grow fast. And what many people in that phase co completely um, uh, um, forget about, it's not to create a 100% solution. Why that? 100% solutions take too long. Usually, you have a very limited opportunity window. So you have to have your product out there. You have to have your company out there. So if you really look for the 100% solution, you might be out because someone else took an 80% solution and had the product already out. There are a lot of examples in the market. Think of the rocket companies, whatever. They go for 80% solutions. It's all about being fast, 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 fast. Marcus, what's the role of HR in this phase? It's a good question. So. Uh, I actually, I'm challenging you guys. Do you think that phase is a phase where you do a lot of personal development, leadership training, whatever? Of course not. What you do is massive recruiting. That's what you do. You almost have nothing else on your plate. So make sure that somehow the payroll is straight and that you fulfill uh, more or less the gross level what has been expected from you. Usually, it's, it's not fun to grow as fast. Yeah? So, but from an HR point of view, your job is really to support and to secure that phase. Because if you don't do that, you might maybe exiting your business at the early, early stage. Here, that's exit. The next phase we all love as HR people. That is a stage where the company gets mature, 
also the product. And at some point, we realized, wait a second, the 80% solution, which brought us here, was good, but not good enough anymore. So now we have to do something. Yeah? So we have to upscale. We have to professionalize. We have to introduce structures, processes. Now we start with leadership programs and trainings. We start with academies. We think if the organizational is still the same or if we have to change that, but wait a second, what is happening here? You changed the company big time also by, uh, by instruments of beliefs and also by instruments of culture. Because all the fun guys who have started at the early stages, they start questioning saying, whether questioning, or not this is their culture. And they're saying, wait a second, before all the good news were shared at the coffee machine, and now we have all kinds of informational setups, uh, town hall meetings, there's that, and I need to ask for permission in order to uh, whatever to, 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 to sign in for my next travel. So a lot of processes and structures are in place, and some people feel insecure about that. Say, so, wait a second, this is not the company I signed for. Yeah. And the only other thing here is the biggest role of HR here is, is to make sure that people understand that this professionalization phase is needed. Otherwise, your next level of growth, your venture capitalist, your IPO, your compliance, your accountants will not sign off for your next level of uh, growth, one. The second thing is, it's also a phase in which either communication and change management helps people understand where the growth phase is, and you shouldn't be afraid to exit, because some people just do not grow in this environment. They just don't like it. They want to be in a startup phase, and they're next, they, they need to move to the next thing. Yeah. So HR needs to play a very proactive role in managing that culture chain. Here is where the rubber hits the ground. Yes, and uh, I've seen a couple of examples where people stay too long in the growth phase. So they neglected the upcoming phase to professionalize. It all ended up in a big chaos. Yeah? No communication, people were lost, no direction. Really, really bad. Yeah? And it's surely but slowly you start declining and more or less you're harming your business. And very often founders are not too good with that professionalization phase because by nature they're not good at this. They're good at founding a company. Okay, what is the next phase? Uh, it's not that hard to guess. The next phase is usually by product, six, seven years, the product and the company becomes mature and mature, and the product becomes a commodity. And commodity is really something what we don't want to be, because the only differentiating factor is probably the price. Yeah? And if the only thing what we differ from each other is the price, this is a bit of a risky position to be in. So what we need to do is we have to reinvent ourselves. And if you think about it, that is something completely different than everything what we have done before. Because we have to question ourselves, we have to disrupt ourselves, probably we have to take things away which had been good before. And from a leadership point of view, from point of view of um, culture, this is very, very tricky because you feel very much disbalanced, because you have the old guys and some of the new guys. And that gives a lot of tension and sometimes also negative energy within the company. But the thing is, if you don't renovate, you might be ending up probably somewhere here, and then you will be in the declining phase. And maybe some guys have, and um, I've experienced that, so if you don't reinvent yourself at early stage or, or early enough, you will be declining and then you are left with a restructuring phase and at some potentially you have layoffs and that is ruining the entire story. So if you have an opportunity to prevent that, do that. But it's a super hard discussion, especially with all the rest of the people who brought the company to that stage, to question everything and to say, listen, probably we have to do it different. And there are super duper examples out there of companies who reinvented themselves over time, over time. Like a company like Amazon, yeah? Yep. And then they go into the next S-curve. So after one S-curve, the next S-curve. But there are also many, many companies who just did one S-curve and then the story was done. So the key message here is, as an HR professional, you have a role. You guys remember, we need to change our mindset, go from the 
from defense to offense, have an opinion about the business, and stop asking for permission to sit at the table. Sit at the table, using this curve and making sure that you have the right questions and the right interventions with your leadership team is what's going to make you add value. Because what Marcus said at the end, pricing is not the only differentiating factor. You need more. And as an HR professional, you need to make sure that these discussions are being had mm. at the right table. Yeah. Yep. So more or less our saying is, first of all, be do it before it's starting any kind of HR initiative, really understand where is the business? What are the challenges for that business? How can you tackle these challenges? And then you translate back into the right supporting HR methods. And if you're good at this, wow, you have created value. And that is value which is probably acknowledged by your management team. And then you have a seat on the table. Yeah. So Edson, so that's a maturity curve. Yeah. And how do we get to talent now? Yeah, that's a really good question. So when you look at this, first of all, let's take a step back. All organization growth, multinationals, there is only one way they can achieve their goals, and that is with talents. So Marcus and I, we have looked at how can you link your talent agenda to this maturity curve of a company. But before you can do that, we need to really talk about which type of talent agendas do we have. So I'll take you to the next slide. All and uh, just, you can, yeah, just click it through. I'll click it through and then I'll... That looks complex, it's not as complex. It's promise. more complex than it is. This is a model that Hydrogen Struggles developed years ago. Um, I think even 20 years ago. Um, and I use this model every time when I'm sitting with an executive team. And they love it. Because first of all, it has figures. HR talks about figures. And there is an axis, so they love that. And they all go, and the first thing they say, yes, we are a talent academy. That's the first thing they all say. And then I ask them, why are we a talent academy? Yes, because we're educating our people. We have a new product and services. They're learning. I said, yes, but do you have a strong employer brand? What is our development budget? Do we really invest in our individuals so that they can start, start working towards the next maturity curve of the company? Are we really investing for the future? Or are we only technically making sure that they can do their jobs? Are you sure you're a talent academy? Debate, debate, big debates. Companies that have a very strong culture, a very strong culture, a very unique product, and that believe that they are the only ones that can make this combination work are a talent academy because they hire young and develop internally. So what do you need for that being a talent academy? So you need to have attrition, yeah? You need to have attrition. You need to have a strong employer branding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you need to have a very, very strong development culture. Your founders need to believe in developing people for the next phase of their business. And, uh, and uh, they have to put a lot of money against it. And a little secret, all HR, all HR people love to be Talent Academy. Yeah. It feels so good, so social. We do something yeah. with the people. Yeah. That's what we have been trained for. But wait a sec. We are a startup, but we are Talent Academy. I don't think so. Um, most, most uh, companies, if they're true and honest to themselves, realize that they might be a talent trader. A talent trader is an organization that says, I know what my products are, I know what my services are, I know that I don't have the money and the time to develop anyone at this moment in time, I go to the market and buy my talent and bring it in. Onboard them and make sure that they can do the job. And I'm willing to pay a high price for that. So I'm not telling anyone any stories. And everyone knows when they come through the front door, they know what they're getting. Then there are the companies that are talent independent. And these are very curious ones. And I, this is not a really good example, but I cannot find a better one. If you are a nuclear physicist and you have only worked in a nuclear plant, there aren't a lot of those around. You are in a niche market. You have a niche talent um, and you are working on a niche product. These are organizations, once you have been hired there, there aren't a lot of options for you to move away and you stay there. By the way, these individuals are highly paid because they have a specific knowledge that only these type of companies can use. And then you have the part where you don't want to be, but where most companies are. 
They never want to hear it, but most of them are there. They're a talent consumer. We hire you, we pay you a lot, we don't offer you any development opportunities because we don't have it, but because of the fact that we pay, pay you a lot, you're stuck, you don't move, you stay. Most companies, specifically companies that have a, a, a historic pedigree, are companies that are here. I will not mention names, but I've worked for several of them. So taking a step back, any question from your side? Any burning question on this concept? Yeah? Is there, is there a mic here in the, in the room? Of course, the burning question is how do you bring uh, your management to move from being a talent consumer to talent academy? Yeah, mm. yeah that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, there are two components for this. I always believe you need, peop you need to meet people half, um, where they are. If the management themselves are not telling you, asking the question, why is my attrition so low? The fact that people are leaving is very low. Why can't I get new blood into the company? Why is the change happening so, so, so slow? If they are not asking these questions and you don't, get, uh, you don't get to offer these questions, they are not really there yet. Um, the maturity curve is what you use to start talking with them about where are we now? Where do you want to be? In what time do you want to be there? Why do you want to be there? Do you believe that with the individuals working for us now we will get there? Asking these questions triggers thinking. And then within three months or two months, some of them need six months, they will come back and say, you remember the discussion we had? Can we have it again? Because I think we need to change something. So the maturity curve is what helps you decide which one of these philosophy you need to stick to. And that brings us to our next, the next part of our presentation. That's true. So um, maybe, Probably what you see most of the times, you see quite a lot of uh, talent academies and also talent traders. But I've seen personally very often that uh, especially management is not willing to, let's say, to provide you with the necess necessary budgets uh, and, uh, and the things you need for that. So then you are somewhere stick in the middle. And to be totally honest, this is really a shitty position to be in. And this is actually something where you don't speak up to what you have promised. Yeah? If you promise to be a talent academy and you have no budgets for training whatsoever, you are not in a good position. Yeah? And people will immediately sense that and sort of your reputation is lost. Yep. So what the next thing is, what we try to do here with you guys, and that is part of the discussion and question. So I have here a little uh, flip chart. So we just had the lecture part. Now it's the exam part. Now it's your time. If you don't ask questions, we will po point to you. The farther away you stand, the more chance you have of being asked a question. So uh, are you ready for it? Huh? All right. He has done this before. So who wants, to, who wants to bite it off? Um, where do you think? So first of all, when you stand up, just briefly your name, the company you work in, and where do you think your company stands on the maturity curve? Who would like to start? Somewhere, someone in, in the back? Sorry, say it again. Uh, go back. This one. The curve. This one. Yeah. Just throw it out there. Who wants to go? Okay, between growth phase and maturity phase, yeah? Here. So that is the phase where you have to prepare yourself. Uh, are you aware of that or? Yeah. yeah? Well, have you done your homework? Yeah, I think so. I mean, in the last year we grew um, a little bit. Um, so last year we hired, I guess, 29 people. Now, right now we're 58 mm -hmm. and we're still growing. But on the other hand, we have our also processes. Let's say, let's say the professionalism is 
um, in place. It is still it requires improvement, obviously, but um, it has you know the kickoff has started and it is going there. Um, yeah. Yeah. And here comes the trick question: uh, When it gets to the realization, okay, I'm somewhere here. So what do you think, and you have probably different picks, what would be the right talent philosophy to follow to support that case? So if you have a chat with your C team members, and they would ask you, so what do we do on HR to make sure that we get to the next level and that this will be a profitable company? So how do you support that? What would be the right talent strategy. So what we would like to do now is to map that picture with that picture. Yep. So what do you think is probably the needed talent philosophy if, and we can take your example, if we are in the middle between growth and, and professionally face. Mm -hmm. What do you think? What's your that is an open question to everyone. Yeah. What do you think? What should, you, what should be the, uh, the supporting model? Mugge, oh, sorry, I, Mugge wanted, yeah, you wanted to answer, go ahead. Go ahead. How, what is it, how I see it? Uh, well, the, the way that I see it today is that we are definitely clear, especially with the management team, that we're not gonna, you know, um, give away from the, from the talent that we want to get, but still we want to have a good culture. So um, I think at this level, especially when you're in the growth phase, you're thinking, okay, um, we can get any talent, let's just get the talent in and start working and actually do good things, but that's not how I see it. The way I see it, actually, it can, we can find a good talent, we will need some time, but uh, we shouldn't, you know, um, we, we shouldn't lose the sight of the good culture and actually people who will be there with us in the long term. Yeah. That's the, that's the strategy that I see. Yeah. And actually develop them, the ones that we have already. So actually, you're, you, you feel that you need to move more to a talent academy phase? Yes, yes. So at this stage, I do. I wouldn't call it talent academy because it obviously we, we are a startup still. Yeah. We need to work fast. We, haven't, uh, we have a need in the yeah. market. We have to deliver the product. But we still need to, um, at least we have to have this beginning phase where we um, invest enough in our people yeah that they understand that we want them to develop, right? So actually, the choice for a talent trader would be a good choice. Yeah. Talent traders are the ones that are very clear with their culture, very clear what they're looking for. They go on the market and get it. They don't have a lot of money for development, but when you walk to the door, you know what you're walking into. Mm -hmm. So the choice for being a talent trader is not a bad choice. It might be a pretty good choice, actually, for the phase you're in now. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, you had also a question. Oh, no. Um I had the idea that I would invent um, a career model, for example, but maybe it's a not easy um, process in this, um, let's say, step <laughs> of um, growth of a startup, I think. So no one even, actually. Like, we have yearly career conversations. Can you speak at the mic, please, so the others can't hear anything? Sure. Uh, we, we even have it, actually. We have, like, biannually career conversations. We talk about where the people want to go. We also support them in the company, even let's say that they want to do something that is not in their area today. We talk about it and we say, okay, let's say in five years, you may not be in Konox because what you actually today imagine may not be in Konox, but how can we support you within those five years to be in our company and actually contribute the best and what, can, what we can add, add to you? Yeah, okay. Great. Anyone else? Lady in the back? Oh, sorry. I'll okay. get back to you. Yeah. So my name is Mavis and I'm from Payworks. I'm the HR coordinator there. So our company was more in the maturity phase. Um, we saw a great spike. Like from last year, we were like 37 and we're currently at 90. What we did was we hired a brilliant head of HR. Okay. Who came in with her expertise and knowledge from another branch and met us who had already been there. Yeah. So we mixed the new and the old and were able to merge the culture together. Nice. So um, that was our strategy and it's working really well. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. thanks. The, yeah, back. Yeah. Um, hi, I have more of a question because um, my employer I see as more like a talent consumer. So um, we hire quite expensive people, to be honest, but uh, we are really dependent on the talent because uh, we are, um, I'm working in the construction branch and we do not have a lot of employees that we can hire. So 
um, what would be your best advice to go like, because we cannot go from a talent consumer right to a talent academy, that's for sure, but like, what would be your advice for the first step into the right direction? Before I answer your question, give me a little bit more background on why, give me a little bit more background on, on the fact that you come to the conclusion that you're a talent consumer. Um, our company exists for um, around 20 years, yeah. but we have been like a very tiny company for like a long time, I would say like 15 years. And now we're an international company of 150 people um, around Europe. So um, we have uh, had a very big growth phase, like around 60% in the last two years. And um, there was only been implemented HR in the last three years. So um, before there was no HR, so obviously no talent, nothing. And uh, this is why I'm pretty sure <laughs> we're still a talent, a talent consumer. Yeah, yeah. So it's, um, again, um, when, we, when we look at these two concepts, we look at them in connection. Um, you just talk about your company growing very fast. So. Um, there are two questions I would like to go back with if I would be sitting in your chair. First of all, questioning my senior leadership, what's going to be the next growth phase? And are they seeing that we need to do something different because of attrition, because of the engagement scores of our employees, because employees are leaving or because we cannot get the right amount of employees in? Are they seeing any of that or feeling any of that? And if they are not, then you might need to think about leadership changes. Um, if they are, then that's where the door is open to start talking about the other three scenarios. Okay, should I, should I answer? Um, yes, they really see the difficulty. Um, we have a lot of difficulty to get people, not because we do not offer the salary they want, but they have like too many choices. So mm -hmm. they could have another job tomorrow and um, they know that, uh, we know that. So sometimes they really pressurize us also. And yeah, I really feel like from an HR point of view, we do not offer enough mm -hmm. at the moment. But this is a very common position to be in. I mean, most of you guys are heavily confronted with an employee market, meaning they have choices all over the place. So, and of course, partially we need to retain our people, but having some blood change as we understood, especially when we, when we go from growth to professionally phase, professionalization phase, there's nothing wrong with. And that lady here, you just mentioned that you had the right mix of old people and new people, different experiences which were mingled and mongled, and the outcome was much, much better. So that is a clear example where you need to, to get some fresh air and some fresh blood in to get to these different standpoints and, and viewpoints. Yeah. To answer your question, my advice would be use the maturity curve have that discussion with them around the coming two, three, five years where they would like to have the company. Use this concept to have a discussion with them about being, having a strong employer brand. What does that mean? That means either pay or good development or, and good culture. And, and see whether or not they have an appetite to move from, from talent consumer to be a talent trader or to be a talent academy. But be very, very clear what the price is for that, because these talent traders and talent academies don't come for nothing. Yeah. That is very often that you just sell or promise something, but you don't get the necessary steps uh, to make that sure. Yeah. Be a talent trader, you most of the time have premiums, premium salaries, or your culture needs to be from such a form formidable um, a positioning that people just choose to come and work for you because of that. Uh, JP Morgan for a long time was a talent trader. Um, they are moving now to becoming a, a talent academy. A talent academy, you have a big, big development budgets. Everything is geared toward making sure that your employees can go to the next phase. You don't pay as much, but you have an employer branding that is premium. So these are the choices that the senior team needs to make or they can choose to stay as being a talent consumer. But then the question is gonna be, what's gonna happen with the growth phase? You go back to your, to your maturity curve. Thank you. Another questions, another remarks. So maybe, maybe it's a bit of a check question. If you're a star, what do you think would be the right talent philosophy? Or what is the talent philosophy, philosophy you actually mostly find? 
Is there any, any guests here in the room? Someone in the back? Anyone part of a startup? People are very shy. Very shy. Tobias, you're not part of a startup? No? Okay. It's the only name, only name I know in the back. Uh, okay. Then in the front end. So Edson, what is your guess? Startup phase. Which of the philosophies they would yes. have? Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but what, what is realistic to find? I, I think realistically, startups are in the talent, I think in the talent independent part. Okay. Um, and the only reason why I say that most of the time they are small, everyone is doing everything, but they need to have a specialization to be able to drive the business forward. Um, and whatever they're doing at that moment in time, it's a bit of a niche. No one has done it before. So they are more in the talent independent phase. So we're dependent on each other to make this thing work. Um, and, and most of the time, they're not very open to bringing other people in unless the individual understands what it is that they're doing. So uh, you're talking passion. about the, the Python programmers, yeah? Precisely. Okay. Yeah. A lot of passion. Um, um, they have a heart. They want to deliver something. And if you don't understand that, you will not fit in. Okay. So, but if you go further to the growth phase, what happens to the talent dependent approach? That has to change, I guess, huh? Um, yeah, that's another challenging question. Um, I, th I think you, you, you have to. You have to because there comes a moment in which your employees also want to be part of that big picture. They also want to be part of that passion. But they're not going to do that unconditionally. They're going to want something from you. They're going to want development. They're going to want pay. They're going to want a good culture. So you as an organization need to start thinking, what are my choices? Do I want to be a trader or an academy? And why do I choose, choose to be a trader or an academy? And what fits better for you? This is, a, this, is a, um, this is a firm decision you're making. and There's nothing wrong. So one is not better than the other. Maybe as an HR person, it, the academy thing feels a bit better. But it's actually not. Yeah? Yeah. And these discussions don't happen in two weeks, right? So, so one word of caution or of inspiration, once you start this process, some management teams will ask you back for discussion, ask you back for discussion, ask you for data. Where do we stand now? What is our attrition? How many people do we have? Do our employees, do they really believe this? They're going to challenge you all over. And the only thing, only way to put them checkmate, that's how I do, go back to the maturity curve. But you said you wanted to grow. You said you wanted to grow in these markets. You said you wanted these talents. There is no way around it, guys. The data shows us that you need to do X, Y, Z in investment. Yeah, Otherwise, you won't be able to do it. Or that you need to innovate. Yeah? This is also, also a spot where many companies are, which are already a bit older. Yeah. Yeah. So professionally face. I hate to say it, but our mm -hmm. time is already our time is almost gone. up. Okay. Um, I love the discussion and yeah. the interaction that yeah. you created. I think we have the chance for one, one last question. question before we close. So who wants to take the last question? There's one in the back. In I the think back? The, yellow, the yellow shirt, we saw that first. So does it work? Yeah. So what are you doing if you don't have the investment? So when you're a startup, you have the growth phase and even going into the maturity phase, um, but you don't have the big money. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. You can answer that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I do that. Uh, first of all, these are, of course, ideal cases. Yeah, And of course, there are actually iterations of that. And if there is very little money, then that's probably the case. But I think it's extremely important that you challenge constantly the wishes and desires of the C people that you say, listen, this is what you want and this is what we do. There is a big gap in between. It doesn't fit. So don't expect here, whatever, that everything comes out of the blue sky. But if you want that I support where, we, where you want to go, this is what we need. And what we try to teach you here a bit, that kind of thinking that you start having an opinion on things, having an opinion on the business and what it takes from an HR point of view, as an example here, what is the right talent philosophy and to mirror to the guys that they either are on track or not. 
yeah. yeah? So, of course, um, sometimes the big budgets don't come like that. So you need to be a bit patient, but slowly but surely you have to work to that. And one addition, in the startup phase, your passion and your dream is your biggest selling point. So don't underestimate the fact that you can go to universities, to network sessions, and get people to want to do things for you without having a lot of money. That's your biggest selling point. Yeah, yeah, you're right. The only thing is that you said, okay, when you are a talent trader, then you have to make sure that what you offered or what you promised, you have to keep. So, but let's say you are in an entertainment business and yeah. you are going risky and uh, projects fail or like win. So you can actually never say if you can do the, let's say, um, academy project you promised for the next year because you don't know how the project goes. So that is sometimes you going roller coaster all the time and you always have to try to yeah, keep the motivation um, within the next project or the next deal or yeah. Yeah, so that is sometimes uh, yeah exhausting. Your, your USP in, ent in entertainment is exposure. Th that's your USP yeah. and that's the trade-off that you're doing with your employees but also with your C-suite constantly. Well, I think we have to unfortunately end the discussion at this point. Thank you very much. I have to say I was a bit curious understanding what spot on HR really is, but now seeing that the maturity curve is the basis and then choosing the right talent man management pattern based on the maturity curve makes a lot of sense to me. Absolutely um, a great approach. Thank you very much for sharing that. Marcus, Edson, thank, thank you, you very for much. Having us. All right. Thank you all for your questions.